We'd like to give you an opportunity to worship God this morning with your finances by giving back a portion of what God has entrusted to you. Tithing is an act of worship, and as followers of Jesus, tithing is an act of worship that we are called to do. Tithes allow us, as a church, to reach out and connect people to Jesus. So to give this morning, you can go and visit thegatheringottawa.com slash giving. Thank you for giving. Hey everybody, Jeff here, lead pastor at The Gathering Ottawa, and it's so good to have you tracking with us online here today. Uh, we post our sermons from our Sunday morning service online on YouTube every Sunday afternoon for two groups of people in particular. First group we post our sermons for are those of you who consider the gathering your home, but you just weren't able to be with us for whatever reason on Sunday morning for worship. Maybe you're traveling for work, maybe you're on vacation, maybe you're sick, maybe you're immunocompromised and you're never able to come. Whatever your story is, for whatever reason it is that you weren't able to be with us on Sunday morning, these sermons are here for you. And we hope that this Sunday's teaching is a blessing to you in your faith journey, wherever it is that you're watching from. But the second group of people that we post these sermons for are those of you who are considering coming to the gathering but just aren't sure yet. You're checking us out online and on YouTube to get a sense of who we are and what we're like and what our teachings like, what are some of the things that we talk about and all that kind of stuff. We recognize that most people nowadays will do that before going to a church. They'll go online and look to get a sense for what that church is like before ever checking them out in person on Sunday mornings. And so if that's you, we hope that these sermons being posted here are a help to you, are a blessing to you in your faith journey, and that maybe, just maybe, we will see you on a Sunday morning service sometime soon. We gather at 10.30 a.m. at St. FX High School in Riverside South in Ottawa. The address there is 3740 Spratt Road, and we would so love to have you join us as we worship Jesus together and open the scriptures together to become more like him together. Uh, we'd love to be able to walk with you and have you join us, not just online, but in person as well. Whatever the case though, whether you're already part of the, the gathering or just checking us out, if there's anything that we can do to serve you, to help you in your faith journey, we'd love to connect with you. Make sure to fill out our online connect card at thegatheringottawa.com slash connect so that we can follow up with you and walk with you in your journey of faith. If you're curious about how to give to the ministry of The Gathering, uh, you can check us out online at thegatheringottawa.com slash giving. There's information there about how to give. And if you're looking just for information about our church, maybe some events that are coming up and all that kind of stuff, all of that's on our website as well. You can find that at thegatheringottawa.com. For now though, we're just so privileged that you take some time to join us and to watch this Sunday's teaching and hope that the sermon from this past week is a blessing to you in your faith journey, wherever you find yourself in your journey of faith with Jesus. And we hope to see you soon on a Sunday morning in person. God bless you. to believe, but we've been in the book of Acts now as a church for almost two years. Can you believe that? We started the book of Acts in September 2021, post-COVID, and uh, I know we still have summer to go before we get to September, but September is only a few months away, almost two years that we've been in the book of Acts off and on. We've taken some breaks here and there as well, but uh, it's been a real joy uh, for me anyway, <laughs> teaching through God's Word, teaching through this book, and just looking to see what it is that the Spirit would have to say to us today about what it is to be the church. And that's really the reason why we started this journey in the book of Acts in the first place. This was right after we started regathering post-COVID, after almost two years not being together in person. And I think for a lot of us, there was some confusion, or, or questions at least, around what the purpose of church is, what God's heart, intent, mission is for the church, what it is to be the church in today's world. And so I thought, hey, let's go to the original source, right? Let's go to the original story, the story of the early church, the first church in the Bible, to look for some fresh inspiration and vision from God for us here today as we figure out what it is to be the church here in 20. 23 now. 
And there's lots of different stories that we've worked through as we've worked through this book. We've got about five or six more sermons post this morning in the book of Acts, and then sadly we're going to say goodbye to the book of Acts for a while. This is the last sermon until the fall. We're going to press pause on Acts and do something else during the summer, so we'll wrap up in the fall. But there's been lots of stories and passages that we've worked through as we've worked through this book. Um, but really, when you boil it all down, there's about three main themes, three things that keep coming to the fore, that kind of bubble to the surface uh, each and every week as we work through the different stories and talk about the different concepts and truths that are in the book of Acts. Three themes I want to remind you of. I talked about this in week one. I won't do a quiz because that was almost two years ago. I don't imagine that for those of you who are even in the room, you'd remember it. So I'll remind you of the three main themes in the book of Acts. First one is this. It's the mission of God. The mission of God. This is a theme that we see prevalent all throughout the book of Acts. As we see God on mission by his spirit through his people in the world, drawing people to himself by the power of his Holy Spirit, as the gospel of Jesus is proclaimed. We see this laid out in right away, right in, in Acts chapter 1, Acts 1 verse 8, and really in what is a key verse for the entire book. It kind of summarizes all the themes of the book of Acts in one verse. Let me read that for you. It's the words of Jesus saying this to his disciples. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, Jesus says, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. Jesus says to his disciples who went on to form the first church that uh, when they received the Holy Spirit, they would go out on mission with him, telling people about him everywhere, bearing witness to Jesus and seeing many people come to know Jesus as a result. That's been a prevalent theme all throughout this book is the mission of God by his spirit, through his people. Second major theme in the book of Acts is the power of the Holy Spirit. We see that in Acts 1 verse 8 as well, don't we? That you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Jesus says that to his disciples, that when the Holy Spirit fills you, your life is going to be different. You're going to be filled with supernatural power, power from on high. To go out and be my witnesses. This is something you can't do in and on your in your own strength. Or at least you can't do it effectively. And so we see time and time again the Holy Spirit empowering His people, empowering the church as they go out on mission. In fact, you could say that this book is called Acts of the Apostles, but it's really Acts of the Holy Spirit through His apostles. That's that's what this book is all about. As we see the Holy Spirit mentioned no less than 55 times in this book. So the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, major theme in this book. And it reminds us, as we read through it, it should remind us anyway, of our complete dependence on the Holy Spirit today. That we, like the early church, we can do nothing of eternal value and significance without the power of the Holy Spirit living within us and working through us. We can't follow Jesus apart from the Holy Spirit. We can't. We can't encourage other people to follow Jesus. We can't get through difficulty, persecution, like the early church did. We can't persevere. Apart from the power of the Holy Spirit, we can't live the Christian life. Full stop. We are in complete dependence on the power of God, available to us in the Spirit of God, which is what we see in the early church here. The power of the Holy Spirit. That's the second major theme. The third one is persecution. The church's perseverance in God's provision. Persecution, the church's endurance or perseverance in God's provision. Whereas the Holy Spirit empowers the church to live into the mission of God in the world, the church in Acts almost always faces persecution as a result. This is like almost every story that we see in the book of Acts as of about Acts 6, Acts 7, Acts 8, when Stephen, the first martyr, is killed. We see the church being jailed and martyred and maligned because of their faith, persecuted because of their faith. But as the church perseveres, doesn't give up, doesn't give up on God, doesn't give up on the mission, doesn't walk away from the power of the Holy Spirit and try to do it in their own strength. As the church perseveres, what do we see? We see God provide for the church time and time again. 
all throughout this book, whether it's providing for them through some sort of supernatural means, right? Supernaturally releasing Peter from jail as an example, or giving them supernatural courage and boldness and strength, power in the moment, the power that they need to endure to persevere. The Spirit of God always provides for the church as they are persecuted and persevere. See this time and time again throughout the book of Acts. And as we look at stories that tell stories about perseverance, persecution, and so on, we're reminded, I think, right, that the the Christian life is hard. It's supposed to be hard. We should expect it to be hard. Um, But God provides for us as we persevere. This idea that God wants you to be happy, healthy, and wealthy, I would love to see how those sermons would have gone over when preached to the early church in the book of Acts. They would have been like, what are you talking about? We're going to jail every other day. We're getting laughed and beaten and whipped. Everybody hates us. We have no money. Happy, healthy, and wealthy. No, we gotta, we got to persevere. we got to stay faithful to Jesus and his call on our life, no matter the challenges that we face. It's true for us, too. Even though we may not face persecution, like the early church did, the Christian life is hard. We are called to endure, to persevere by the power of the Holy Spirit. These are the three main themes that we see throughout the entire book of Acts. And in some way, every sermon that I've preached, every text that we've looked at, has circled around one or even all three of these themes. And this morning's passage is no exception to that. We're going to look at Acts 21 and 22, most of those chapters. As we see Paul arriving in Jerusalem after having been led by the Holy Spirit, right? He's filled with the Holy Spirit, walking in tune with what the Spirit of God is doing, right? He's being led by the Holy Spirit to Jerusalem. He's on mission with and for God. He's going to preach the good news of Jesus in Jerusalem. And then what happens as he gets to Jerusalem? So we're going to see this morning. He faces immediate backlash, persecution (laughs) as a result. He's being led by the Spirit on mission with God, faces persecution as a result. As he goes from the hero of the book of Acts, in a sense, to the goat. (laughs) We see him up until this point in the book of Acts. He's traveling around the known world at that time, planting churches, preaching the gospel. He's, He's the hero of the story, in a sense. He can do no wrong. Yeah, he's faced some challenges. He's been thrown in prison and so on, but he's unstoppable at this point, right? He's the hero. But now in Jerusalem, he goes to being kind of the goat, in a way, as we see him eventually thrown in prison, beaten, and kind of his ministry, his career, if you like, uh, the trajectory of his ministry completely changes. No no more traveling around the world. He is stuck in Jerusalem, and uh, life is forever changed for him in this moment. So, if you have your Bibles... I want to invite you to open them with me. Uh, Acts 21, we're going to start in verse 17, and we're going to go through all the way to chapter 22, verse 29. Long text this morning, so don't worry. We're not going to necessarily read every single verse. I'm going to have to summarize sections of it for you and explain it to you. But no doubt whether we read each word or not, uh, you're going to be encouraged this morning as we open God's Word. And God, I believe, wants to speak to you this morning. That as we open God's Word, we call it God's Word. Why? Because when we open God's Word, He speaks. If we are ready to receive and hear what it is that He would have to say to us. So this morning, as we open God's Word, let's be ready to receive what it is that He has to say to us this morning through this um, interesting passage, long story, if you will. Let's dig in, starting with Acts 21, verse 17. When we arrived after having been led, right, by the Holy Spirit so clearly to Jerusalem, the brothers and sisters, the the Christians, the church, in Jerusalem welcomed us warmly, as the church was known to do, right? We talked about this last week, if you were with us, about hospitality and how the early church was known to be incredibly hospitable, right? If Paul and his crew were to arrive in a random city and they needed a place to stay, what did they do? They went and found the church. They went and found the Christians, and they were given a place to stay. We're called to be hospitable in the same, a similar way. Maybe we're not hosting people in our homes, but being hospitable to people, opening our lives to people, creating space for the stranger. Verse 18. The next day, Paul went with us to meet with James, who was the half-brother of Jesus and the author of the book of James, the New Testament. 
and all the elders, the leaders of the Jerusalem church were also present. After greeting them, Paul gave a detailed account of the things God had accomplished among the Gentiles. Gentiles being a word that just simply describes non-Jewish people, right? People who weren't ethnically Jewish through his ministry. As God used Paul and his team to plant multiple churches throughout Asia Minor and Rome. This is essentially what we've seen Paul up to, right? Up until this point in all of his missionary journeys, traveling around, whether it's the Thessalonica, Corinth, Ephesus, Athens. He's planting churches everywhere that he goes, leading many people to Jesus as a result. He's telling the story to these elders in Jerusalem who are kind of the head honchos of the church. He's telling them, look at what God's doing. Look at how good he has been as we've traveled the world preaching the gospel, looking to plant churches. Verse 20. After hearing this, they praised God, which is actually no small thing, right? Because accepting, receiving Gentiles, non-Jewish people into the church, that was a controversial thing. But they praised God. Yes, God, bringing Gentiles to Jesus. And then they said, you know, dear brother, how many thousands of Jews have also believed. And they all follow the law of Moses very seriously. So praise God for the Gentiles coming to faith in Jesus, but praise God also that many Jewish people are also coming to faith in Christ. But, verse 21, but, James says, here's the rub, okay? Here's the problem with all of this, James is saying. The, the Jewish believers here in Jerusalem, there's so many that have come to faith, very faithful to the Jewish law. They've been told that you are teaching all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn their backs on the law of Moses. They've heard that you teach them not to circumcise their children or to follow other Jewish customs. This is a problem, James says. The problem because these Jewish believers, he's saying, they don't really like you all that much. They don't like your teaching all that much. They, they feel that maybe you've abandoned your Jewish roots and that you're teaching things that are contrary to the Jewish law. And so you being here is going to be hard for many of the Jewish believers because they're concerned about the kind of things that you're teaching. You're, you're telling people not to follow the law, which is not exactly actually what Paul was teaching. He wasn't telling people not to follow the Jewish law. He was simply teaching, this is important, he was simply teaching that salvation is not something that you achieve by following all the rules, following the Jewish law, being really good. It's not something you achieve, but it's something that you receive by placing your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to save you, by placing your faith not in your work, but in his work, what he's accomplished for you on the cross and the empty tomb. Salvation is not something you achieve, but it is something you receive in Christ. Paul talks about this explicitly throughout his letters uh, as he wrote to churches. Probably the most clear place that he articulates this is in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. Let me show you what he said there. This summarizes Paul's teaching. So God saved you by his grace when you believe. Not by your works, right? By his grace. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that we have done, so none of us can boast about it. Paul's very clear, whether you're Jewish, whether you're Gentile, whether you're something else, a person is not made right with God. They are not saved by the good things that they do. How many people know lots of good people in the world, good neighbors, they give money maybe to the poor, they're kind, they treat their family nice, but they don't know Jesus. We, we all know people like this. That's not enough to save a person. Only Jesus makes people right with God. Salvation is not something you achieve by being really good. It's something you receive by surrendering your life to Jesus, placing your faith in Christ to save you. God saved you by his grace, Paul says, not by your works so that no one can boast. That was Paul's teaching in a nutshell. And these Jewish believers in Jerusalem, they either didn't understand his teaching or they didn't like his teaching. And they felt that they needed to follow the Jewish law, do certain things in order to achieve salvation. Yes, Jesus died for us and for our sin and so on, but we still have to also do this in order to follow Jesus, in order to be made right with God. And Paul's saying, no. 
That's not how it works. You're not saved by good works, by following Jewish law. Back to the text now, verse 22. So what should we do about this problem? James asks Paul. We've got Jewish believers here. They don't like your teaching. They're concerned about you being here. Or once they find out that you're here, they're not going to like it. So what do we do about this? They will certainly hear that you have come. It's not going to go well for you. Well, here's what we should do, James says, answering his own question. Here's an idea, he says. We have four men here who have completed their vow. James says their, their Nazarite vow, a vow of consecration, which lasted about 30 days, and a vow, by the way, that we see Paul himself taking in Acts 18. So he wasn't opposed to Jewish law. He himself still engaged in some of the Jewish customs and traditions. But anyway, so we've got four men who have completed their vows. Go with them, James says to Paul, to the temple and join them in, purifi- in the purification ceremony, making yourself clean. And then he says, paying for them to have their heads ritually shaved. Which is quite an expensive proposition for Paul. This was not just like going to the local barber shop here and paying 20 or $30 to have dudes hairs, hairs cut. I don't even know what, how you speak about it anymore because it's been so long. Uh, for me, this was not just getting a normal haircut, right? This was an offering that these men would have been expected to pay as Nazarites at the end of their vow. Very expensive sacrifice offering. Uh, for them to make. So this was an expensive suggestion by James to Paul. Paul could have said, like, I, I don't know how you expect me to pay for this. That's an expensive option. But okay. James says, then, if you do this, everyone will know that the rumors that are going on about you, going on out there about you, that they're false. And that you yourself observe the Jewish laws. Because they'll have witnessed, you know, a perfect example of you stepping into Jewish customs, being a part of this thing, they'll see that it's false what people are saying about you right before their eyes and everything will be okay. This is James's proposal. A proposal that James and the other elders there with him felt might help to squelch people's concerns, the Jewish believers' concerns about him. I'm skipping down to verse 26 now. We read what happens next. So Paul went to the temple the next day with the other men. They had already started the purification ritual, so he publicly announced the date when their vows would end and sacrifices would be offered for each of them, which, which I think just shows how conciliatory Paul was here, right? That even though Paul understood, that Paul knew, that Paul believed theologically that he didn't have to do this stuff, that he didn't have to follow the Jewish customs, he didn't have to follow the Jewish law, he wasn't required to do so, it wasn't something that he felt he needed to do. He was willing to comply for the sake of unity with his Jewish brothers and sisters. Saying, okay, if this is something that's going to help bring us together rather than tear us apart, even though I don't agree with it, I'm going to comply with it. There's nothing wrong with doing this, so I'm going to go ahead and do it. It reminds me actually of Paul's words. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 20. See this time and time again throughout Paul's missionary journey. He says, when I was with the Jews... I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who followed the Jewish law, I too lived under that law, even though I'm not subject to the law. I said, I didn't have to do it, but I did this so that I could bring to Christ those who are under the law, or in this particular case, for the sake of unity as well. Paul says, wherever I went, Jew, Gentile, kind of whatever the customs were, whatever the culture was, I adapted. I worked with the people who were wherever they were at, in order to see people come to know Jesus, in order to bring people to Christ. That's what missionaries do. That's what Paul was doing as a good missionary. Which I think shows incredible maturity from Paul. Here, right? That he was able and willing to put aside his convictions and his rights, his freedoms. He could have said, no, I don't have to do that because here's why, and given a good theological explanation and refused to oblige, but he didn't do that. So for the sake of others, for the sake of my brothers and sisters, I'm going to lay down my rights, my privileges, my convictions for them. That's what he does here. The Jew, he became a Jew. He too lived under the Jewish law, even though he didn't have to. A ton of maturity here from Paul. Great example for us. Maybe we don't have Jewish... Uh, people in our family, Jewish people in our neighborhood that we're trying to reach, but there are people who live differently than we do, 
different cultural backgrounds, different convictions, things that we don't agree with. What does following Paul's example here look like in those hard situations where people see the world very differently than us? And we need to find an inroad with them. We comply for the sake of unity, for the sake of seeing maybe them come to faith in Christ. Verse 27. The seven days were almost ended when some Jews from the province of Asia, probably from Ephesus, you see them all throughout the book of Acts, it seems, following Paul wherever they went. They were like on a witch hunt trying to find Paul and stop him. They saw Paul in the temple and roused the mob against him. Roused the mob against him. Now, how exactly did they do that? Well, they did that by accusing him of two things. And it's interesting. We'll look at these two things in a moment. They're the exact same two things that Stephen, who I mentioned earlier, Christianity's first martyr, back in Acts 6 and 7, same two things that Stephen was accused of. Paul stood there as Stephen was executed, murdered, and now he's being accused of the exact same two things as Stephen. There's some irony here in the story, which is interesting. She was now on the other foot for Paul. They grabbed him, verse 28, they grabbed him yelling, here's the first, here's the first accusation they yelled at him. Men of Israel, help us. This is the man who preaches against our people everywhere and tells everybody to disobey the Jewish laws. Accusation number one. He tells everybody everywhere to disobey the Jewish laws, which was simply not true. Actually, Paul Paul didn't have, when you read Paul's uh, letters, Paul didn't really have a problem with the Jewish law. And he certainly did not instruct people to to disobey the Jewish law. In fact, you see him doing just the opposite in Romans 14. You won't look at it, but if you want to read Romans 14, he says, hey, some people follow certain customs, they follow certain rituals, certain festival days, follow the Sabbath, that's fine. If you feel you need to do that, that's fine. Other people don't. The point is that we shouldn't break fellowship over these issues. He's not saying it's wrong to do these things. He's simply saying that if you think that obeying the Jewish law can save you and make you right with God, if you think just by following all the rules is going to make you right with God, you're wrong. We're saved by grace through faith in Christ, not by our works. Right? Salvation is something you receive. It's not achieved. But, following certain aspects of the law and this culture and these customs, if that's important to you, Paul was fine with that. He wasn't saying you, you should never follow the Jewish law, that it's wrong for you to do that. But that's the first thing he's accused of here, right? That he's instructing people to disobey Jewish laws. He was being misunderstood. It was not true. The second thing they accuse him of is this. He speaks against the temple and even defiles this holy place by bringing in Gentiles, non-Jewish people, breaking the law, breaking the Jewish law. For earlier that day, they had seen him uh, in the city with Tromithius, Tromithus, however you say that, a Gentile from Ephesus, and they assumed, how, how many know what happens when you assume things? Oh, Kristen, thank you for that. Yeah, that's good. She's on sick leave right now, so she's allowed to swear in church. Uh, you got to clean that up before you come back to work. <laughs> right? yeah, but you're absolutely right. They assumed that Paul had taken him into the temple, which he had not done. Right? This was not a, a true or fair accusation. This had not happened. They were just looking for any reason that they could find to accuse Paul and to rile up the crowd, to start a mob. And it worked. Look at what happened next, verse 30. The whole city was rocked by these accusations, and a great riot followed. Paul was immediately dragged and uh, grabbed and dragged out of the temple, and immediately the gates were closed behind him in order to safeguard the temple's purity. As they were trying to kill him, and they're actively attempting murder right now, they're trying to kill him, probably by stoning him, as they did Stephen. Word reached the commander of the Roman regiment that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. And of course, the Romans were always on guard against public disorder, chaos. They didn't want riots breaking out. It's the last thing they wanted. So verse 32, he immediately called out, as the commander did, out his soldiers and officers and ran down among the crowd. When the mob, the mob saw the commander and the troops coming, 
They stopped beating Paul. Who knows how alive he even was at this point. If he's half dead, if he's barely conscious, we don't know. They knew, these Jewish people did, that when the Romans come, there's trouble, right? We've got to stop, or we're, we're in big trouble. So they stopped beating Paul. Verse 33. Then the commander arrested him, Paul, and ordered him bound with two chains. Now, if you were with us last week, you might remember the prophecy that this man, Agabus, had, right? Where Paul was going to be bound up in chains and handed over to the Gentiles. You can imagine Paul, he's getting bound up in chains. He's like, ooh, that's right. That Agabus guy from last week, he knew what he was talking about. True prophetic word. Reading on, he, the commander, asked the crowd who he, who Paul, was and what he had done, assuming that Paul was some sort of violent revolutionary. In fact, if you look at verse 38, we won't read it, but they they thought Paul was a a violent revolutionary from Egypt. This was probably a man they had been trying to hunt down for some time, and for whatever reason, they believed Paul was this guy from Egypt. And so they were like, let's go get him. This is the guy we want to get in custody and deal with, because he had led like 4,000 people in a revolt against Rome. Verse 34. Some shouted one thing or another, since he couldn't find out the truth and all the uproar and confusion this commander. He ordered that Paul be taken to the fortress. As Paul reached the stairs, the mob grew so violent, the soldiers had to lift him to their shoulders to protect him. When the crowd followed behind him, shouting, kill him, kill him. And who's this to remind you of, by the way? Jesus. Crucify him. Crucify him. There's tons of overlap, similarity here, actually, between what's happening with Paul in Jerusalem and what happened to Jesus in Jerusalem. We'll get back to that a little bit later. But skipping down to verse 1 of chapter 22 now, where after this commander learned more about who Paul was, that he was, in fact, not a violent revolutionary from Egypt, he actually allowed Paul to address the crowd, to get up and to make a speech. Brenda read that speech for us. We won't read it all for you, but here's how it started in verse 1. Brothers and esteemed fathers, Paul said, as he spoke to them so respectfully. These people are just beating the car out of him. And look how respectful he is. Brothers and esteemed fathers. What an example. Listen to me as I offer my defense. When they heard them, heard him speaking in their own language, as Paul did as a courtesy to him, spoken Aramaic, the silence was even greater. Again, such respect that Paul had for his accusers. Now, we won't read it, but Paul then, uh, Brenda read it for us already, Paul then, as he gives his speech, he tells this story in verses 3 through to 21. Three different things that he talks about in his story were first in verses 3 through to 5, he cites his religious credentials, right? He, he talks about he was a, how he was a standout Jewish leader, educated in Jerusalem under Gamil. He was a Pharisee, well-known teacher, trained Paul in the Jewish law and customs. He talks about how he was so zealous for God, going so far as to persecute followers of the way, uh, to, follow, uh, to, to persecute Christians, even killing some of them. He cites his religious example, or his uh, credentials, rather saying to them, in effect, like, I I get it. I understand you. I understand the uproar. Like, I get it more than the average person can get it, because I was just like you. I get it. And then in verses 6 through 16, Paul tells the story of his conversion experience as well, doesn't he? Which is the second time. There's three times in the book of Acts that we see Paul's conversion story told. Uh, This is the second time. It's interesting. Luke, the author of Acts, makes sure that that story is told at least three times in the book of Acts. Very important to the overall story of the early church. We won't look at it, but you can find that story in Acts chapter 9, where Paul encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus. Bright light was blinded, surrendered his life to Jesus. He tells the story. He's like, hey, I was like you, but then I encountered Jesus. I came to discover who Jesus was. Surrendered my life to him. And then after all of this, after citing his religious credentials and telling his conversion experience, he then shares his calling story in verses 17 through 21. He talks about how he had this vision from Jesus as he was praying in the temple. And that Jesus said these words to him. Verse 21, we'll read this. 
Jesus said to Paul, go, leave Jerusalem, leave where you are, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Jesus says to Paul, not, not to your own people, not to the Jewish people, even though you're so trained and familiar with this culture and with these customs, I'm going to send you away as a missionary to the Gentiles. Totally foreign cultures, totally foreign people, people that you don't know, and I'm going to use you as my instrument, as my witness to bring many people to know Jesus. This is the line that got Paul in trouble. This is the line that didn't go over well. Look at what happened next, verse 28. The crowd listened. They're like, okay, religious credentials, conversion story, okay, cool. They listened until Paul said that word. What word? Gentiles. Then they all began to shout, away with such a fellow. He isn't fit to live. They yelled, threw off their coats, and tossed handfuls of dust into the air. Which is quite a, imagine you went to Parliament you know, and that was the way people protested today. They're like ripping off their coats and throwing dust in the air. Culturally, this was how they, I guess, expressed their disgust. It was quite a violent reaction from these Jewish people, isn't it? Begs the question, why? Why so violent? Why such a big reaction? Well, they reacted so big because suggesting, for Paul to suggest that Gentiles could become Christians without first having to become Jewish, that was not okay. That was heresy, in fact. And it was tantamount to saying that Jews and Gentiles were equal before God, since both could come to God through Christ. The Jewish people, for them, they, they were the chosen people, right? They were God's special people, his, his, um, the ones that he had covenanted with. For, for, for Paul to suggest otherwise, the Gentiles were now included in that without having to also become Jewish, not okay. So they reacted violently against that. The story ends, or at least this part of the story of Paul's time in Jerusalem. It ends in verses 24 through to 29, which we won't read. But it ends with the commander bringing Paul inside, getting him away from the chaos of the crowd, and ordered him to be lashed, flogged with whips, Likely in an effort to get him to confess. He's like, this dude is someone bad. We know he's someone bad. Look at how everybody's reacting. He's got to be a bad dude. Let's whip him until he confesses and tells us who he is. But as they were about to start, Paul asked them if it was actually legal for them to whip a Roman citizen, as Paul was a Roman citizen, without first having a trial. Paul, of course, knew the answer to that question. He's very clever. It was a question that led to all sorts of confusion amongst the Roman officers. They didn't know, the commander didn't know that Paul was a Roman citizen, and so they withdrew, refusing to whip Paul before some sort of trial took place first, which is what happens in the next section that you're going to have to come back in September to hear about. But this is the story of Paul the persecuted. Right? He used to be the persecutor, before he came to faith in Christ. Now, now he's being persecuted for his faith as he enters Jerusalem. And despite his best efforts to connect with the Jewish people there, being as conciliatory as he was, it doesn't go well for him. And he's almost killed as a result. As he goes from the hero to the ghost in the story. It's interesting, I mentioned this earlier, there's, there's a lot of similarities here between Paul's story as he enters Jerusalem and Jesus' story as he approached the cross just outside of Jerusalem. And for example, like Jesus, Paul experienced intense opposition from hostile Jewish people who plotted against his life. And like Jesus, Paul often spoke before he got to Jerusalem about his coming sufferings in Jerusalem. Like Jesus, Paul had followers who tried to discourage him from going to Jerusalem in the first place and the fate that awaited him there. We looked at this last week. Jesus' disciples did the same thing to Jesus. Like Jesus, Paul expressed his complete devotion to the will of God, even if it meant laying down his life 
Like Jesus, Paul was unjustly arrested on the basis of false accusations. Like Jesus, Paul alone was arrested, but none of his companions. Notice how this passage in Acts 21, verse 17 starts with we language. We were together. Where's the we <laughs> here when Paul is being arrested? They're, who knows where they are? They're, they're hiding somewhere in the distance. Like Jesus, Paul heard the mob crying out, away with him. And like Jesus, the Roman officer handling Paul's case did not know his true identity. On and on and on we could go. There's just so many similarities here. Luke is very intentional in the way that he lays out this story. He's pointing us to Jesus. The one whose message the church is preaching. The one who it's all about. It reminds me of Paul's words in Philippians 3 verse 10, actually, which we won't read. But in that verse, he talks about how he longs to know, longs to have fellowship in Christ's sufferings, being conformed to his death. I mean, remember that verse. He says, I want to be like Christ in his sufferings. I want to know Christ in his sufferings. Paul experienced that here, didn't he? And experienced that in a way that the rest of us, I would imagine, have never experienced and never will. Facing intense persecution. Luke's very intentional in this story, pointing us to Jesus, pointing us to the cross, to what it is that Jesus accomplished for us, reminding us, right? Salvation is not something you achieve by being really good, but it's something you receive. That's what this whole story is about. That's the subtext of this story. Jesus. It's the gospel. It's what Jesus did for us on the cross. So what do we do with this story? Long story, lots of uh, words, lots of verses in it. What do we to do with it? Well, I have three questions for us to consider as we wrap up. I want to encourage you to reflect on. First question is this. In what ways might you tend to believe that salvation and or God's favor, love, blessing in your life is something that is achieved instead of received? In what ways might you think that you have to earn your salvation or you have to earn God's love and blessing in your life? This isn't something that just non-Christians, by the way, struggle with. This is something that Christians struggle with. But we think we've got to be really good in order for God to hear our prayers. And we have to be really good. We have to follow all the rules in order to be accepted by God. That God's angry at us, that he's... Um, He's going to judge us harshly for all the terrible things that we've done. If we don't clean up our act, we're in trouble. We even come here on Sundays, many of us, and we try to engage in worship through songs, but the guilt, the shame that we feel is just so intense because we know that we don't, we don't measure up, that our works, our deeds don't measure up, that we're not good enough in and of ourselves. The good news of Jesus is you aren't good. You aren't good enough in and of yourself. You need a Savior. And you didn't just need a Savior at the point of salvation. You need a Savior from point A through to point Z in your Christian journey. Every step of the way, all is grace. We need Jesus. We need to walk in His grace, knowing that His love, His blessing, His goodness in our lives, it's all a gift. It's all grace. It's all because of what Jesus did on the cross. You can't achieve any of it. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be good. <laughs> doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to follow Jesus. Of course you should, but in response to His grace, not to earn it. But we fall into this trap. Oh, I, I do all the time, man. I, like, oh, I haven't really been praying enough lately. God's probably upset with me. I'm not reading my Bible enough lately. Probably God, that's why I'm not experiencing His blessing in my life. Oh, like, it's all about me and what I do. That's not the gospel. So in what ways do you maybe tend to believe that salvation or even God's favor, love, blessing in your life is something that is achieved instead of received? As followers of Jesus, we've got to keep coming back to that question, to the grace of Jesus, lest we make it about ourselves and our own effort. Question two. In what ways have you potentially bought into the lie that the Christian life is supposed to be easy? That if you follow Jesus, all will be well. 
No suffering, no pain, no sickness. God's going to heal you. He's going to fill your bank account with money. He's going to bless you, prosper you. And hey, like, sometimes that happens. Sometimes he does heal. Sometimes he does provide miraculously, even through numbers, finances, dollars. But not because of you earning it or praying a certain way or doing the right thing. As a fo- Following Jesus is not supposed to be easy. It's supposed to be impossible. That's why we need the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, because we can't do it in and of ourselves. We can't follow Jesus apart from the Holy Spirit, daily surrendering our lives to Him. So in what ways, if you potentially bought into the lie, and it is a lie, that the Christian life is supposed to be easy, that you'll avoid suffering, pain, sickness, evil, if you just follow Jesus, pray this simple prayer. And thirdly, just to bring it all together, how might God be inviting you to respond to his grace today? Those words, respond to his grace, are very intentional. Not earn God's favor, earn God's blessing, do certain things in order to make yourself right with God. No, respond to his grace. That as you experience the grace, the love, the mercy of God in your life through Christ, recognizing what he's accomplished for you on the cross and the empty tomb, taking our sins upon himself, doing what we could have never done for ourselves, making us right with God. The more that we understand the depths of what God has done, the more that we understand his grace, the more we're able to respond to his grace. To say, man, if God, Jesus, if you would do that for me, you've done, like, I just want to live out of the, out of response, out of a love response back to you whole life following you, surrendering this, surrendering that. It's all in response to your grace. So how might God be inviting you to respond to his grace? Just surrender to him. Just say yes to Jesus in some area of your life. I want to take just a moment and encourage you just to prayerfully. We do this on Sundays often. Throw some questions up. Um, don't want us to rush out of here. So I want to take a moment or two and just encourage you to, to prayerfully consider these three questions in the quietness of this room in prayer before God. Consider how God is speaking to you and how he's inviting you to respond to his word, respond to his grace. Here too. Take a few moments to reflect and pray, and then I'll wrap up with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we confess that as fallen, sinful people, as humans, we often fall into that trap of assuming that your goodness, your blessing in our lives, salvation even, is something that we achieve as opposed to simply receiving from you. We think that if we just try harder, work harder, do more, be better, follow the rules, more fully will be accepted more by you. will be loved more by you. will be blessed more than you, by you. will be forgiven more. We thank you for the cross. We thank you, Jesus, that you made a way where there was no way, that where we could not save ourselves, we could not make ourselves right with you, we couldn't deal with our sin, our shame, we still can't. You made a way. And so we surrender our lives to you afresh here this morning, Jesus, to your gospel, to your truth, to your grace. 
to receive your grace into our lives. We pray, Spirit of God, that you fill us with your power, with the grace of Jesus, so that we can live in response to that grace, that we follow you in response to your goodness in our life. Not out of a desire or a, a, a thought that we have to earn it, but all in response to your grace. God, would you empower us by your Spirit to do that? Because we can't do it on our own. We also confess, God, that sometimes we assume that the Christian life is something that's supposed to be easy, or at least not hard. <laughs> that there shouldn't be pain and difficulty that, that comes along with following Jesus. We confess that we've fallen into that trap. We know it's not true. But we thank you that you're with us in the midst of pain and difficulty. Just as you were with the early church, with Paul in this story, that you never left them nor forsake them, and they'll never leave us, nor forsake us. For those of us who are in Christ Jesus, you are always present, always with us, through every valley, through every difficulty, through all pain, sickness, even death, you're with us. And in the end, you promise to return and one day do away with pain and sickness and death. Make all things right. We look forward to that day. But for now, Jesus, would you empower us by your spirit to be faithful despite difficulty and disappointment in life. Would you speak to each heart here in this place too about how to respond to your grace given the different stories and situations that we're facing in our lives. Speak to us about what it means to be gospel people, to be Jesus people, grace people in a world that assumes that you've got to work to achieve everything that you are. Show us what that looks like, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.